So Sam Altman makes an appearance at the AI for Good Global Summit. He joins in remotely while his interviewer is live on stage. Now, in order to make sure that he's human, he has to do a sort of physical captcha, if you will. So in case you were wondering, hello, that's the new way that we're going to be proving we're human, I guess. But it gets better from there because Sam Altman gives us a little preview into what's coming next, what AI will bring in the very near future. Now, by this point, you probably heard that OpenAI has recently begun training its next frontier model. Now, we're not exactly sure what to call this. It's not GPT-5 by the sound of it, or what we would think of as GPT-5, according to some announcements at the Microsoft Build Conference at the AI Summit in Paris, France, OpenAI will be dropping another model later this year. People have been red teaming it, testing it, but this is the next thing. The next big thing that's going to be coming down the line, they're getting away from the GPT-4, 5, 6 con naming convention. They're going with something a little bit different. So we don't know exactly what this is called, but that's what's coming. He talks a little bit about what to expect from these bigger, better, smarter models. Some new updates on the Omni model, the voice mode, etc. Some good news on that. And to top it all off, they kind of go down a rabbit hole that I did not expect. With that said, let's get started. What is the first big good thing we'll see happen? And what is the first big bad thing we'll see happen when it starts to really have an impact? So I think the area where we're seeing impact even now uh, is productivity. Uh, software developers are uh, the most commonly cited example, and I think probably still the best one to use, where people can just do their work much faster, more effectively, work more on the parts that they want. And like other sort of technological tools, they become part of a workflow, and then it's it's pretty quickly becomes difficult to imagine working without them. Um, and so I expect that pattern to happen in more areas where we'll see we'll see different industries become much more productive than they used to be because they can use these tools, and that'll sort of have a positive impact on everything from writing code to uh, how people how how we teach, how we learn. Um, how healthcare works, uh, and it'll see this increase in efficiency. And I think that'll be the first uh, really detectable positive thing. And I, I'd say we're already um, we're already in that. Uh, first negative thing. I, I mean, obviously there are already some negative things happening with the tools. Uh, I would say cybersecurity. I don't know if it'll be the first, but it's one that I want to call particular attention to. Is something that I I, I think could be quite a problem. Next, they talk about the limits of AI progress. When they say asymptotic, they mean, are we approaching a limit, a wall of some sort, of the speed of AI progress? As you train it, what level of improvement do you think we're likely to see? Are we likely to see kind of a linear improvement, or are we likely to see asymptotic improvement, or are we likely to see any kind of exponential, very surprising improvement? Great question. Uh, we don't expect that we're near an asymptote, um, but... You know, this is like a debate in the world, and I think the best thing for us to do is uh, just show, not tell. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people making a lot of predictions, and I think what we'll try to do is just do the best research we can um, and then figure out how to responsibly release whatever uh, whatever we're able to create. I expect that it'll be hugely better in some areas and surprisingly not as much better in others, which has been the case with every previous model. But... This feels like the conversation we've had every uh, other model release. You know, when we were going from 3 to 3.5 and 3.5 to 4, there's a lot of debate about, well, is it really going to be that much better? Uh, if so, in what ways? And the answer is there still seems to be a lot of headroom. Um, and I expect that we will make progress on some things that people didn't expect to be possible on the whole. Just a quick plug here, please forgive me. I do believe that the full release of the Omni model, including the voice engine and all that goes with it, will be a big step towards allowing us to build autonomous AI agents. If that's something that you're interested in, consider joining my group Natural 20, as that's what we're going to be talking about probably in the next few weeks. Next, they talk about synthetic data. Now, as we saw with some of this new research with Orca 2, for example, out of Microsoft and a number of others, there may not be a downside to synthetic data, to data produced by AI. It just matters whether or not it's high quality 
high quality data or not. For example, Orca 2 is trained on the outputs of GPT-4. GPT-4 would answer these little riddles or word problems, let's say, and then it would explain its reasoning. That data would be fed into this new model Orca 2, which then became really effective at doing those sorts of problems. It would be as good as models 10 times its size in that specific area. What's interesting is both Mark Zuckerberg in his interview when Llama 3 was released and Sam in this interview are kind of hinting at this idea that the idea of training runs and data production, it's not quite as cut and dry as we initially thought it was. It seems like it's becoming a bit more of a continuous sort of cycle, a flywheel of sorts. Though this is also the first time you're going to have a model that will be trained in large part on synthetic data. It's, I mean, I presume, because the web now contains lots of synthetic data, meaning data that was created by other large language models. How worried are you that training a large language model on data created by large language models will lead to corruption of the system? It, I think what you need is high quality data. There is low quality synthetic data, there's low quality human data, um, and as long as we can find enough quality data to train our models or ways, another thing is ways to train, you know, get better at data efficiency and learn more from smaller amounts of data or any number of other techniques, uh, we're, I think that's okay. And I'd say we feel like we have what we need for this next model. Are you, have you created massive amounts of synthetic data to train your model on? Have you self-generated data for training? We, we, of course, have done all sorts of experiments, including generating lots of synthetic data. Um, my hope is that there will be, you know, there, there, there'd be something like very strange if the best way to train a model was to just generate like a quadrillion tokens of synthetic data and feed that back in. It would, you'd say that like somehow that seems inefficient and there ought to be something where you can just learn more from the data as you're training. Uh, and, you know, I think we still have a lot to figure out. But yeah, of course, we've generated um, lots of synthetic data to experiment training on that. But uh, I, again, I think the real, the core of what you're asking is how can you learn more from less data? That's interesting. Last week, I asked Claude 3 to generate some code for me. And it was like, I can't. I'm a bridge now, which was confusing. It was part of Anthropic's research into interpretability. So basically understanding which neurons in these neural nets in these large language models, which neurons contribute to the generation, what, what they're actually doing, what they're thinking. And the reality is we don't really know, we're just beginning to discover it, which certainly scares some people. It's a bit of a black box. Here's Sam Altman tackling that issue. Last year, you did this fascinating interview with Patrick Collison. Uh, the founder of Stripe. And he asked this great question. He said, is there anything that could change in AI that would make you much less concerned that AI will have dramatic bad effects in the world? And you said, well, if we could understand what exactly is happening behind the scenes, if we could understand what is happening with one neuron, and you wish that you could do that in the guts, not at just the interface level. Is that the right way to think about it? And have you solved this problem? I think that safety is going to require like a whole package approach, but this question of interpretability does seem like a useful thing to understand. And there's many levels at which that could work. Uh, we, we certainly have not solved interpretability. There's a number of things going on I'm very excited about, but nothing close to where I would say, yeah, you know, everybody can go home. We, we've got this figured out. Uh, it does seem to me that the more we can understand what's happening in these models, the better. And, and I think that can be part of this cohesive package to how, how we can make and verify safety claims. But if you don't understand what's happening, isn't that an argument to not keep releasing new, more powerful models? Well, we don't understand what's happening in your brain at a neuron by neuron level. And yet we know you can like follow some rules and we can ask you to explain why you think something. Uh, th there are there are other ways to understand a system besides understanding uh, it at, at the sort of neuron by neuron level. Um, the, the characteristics, the behavior of these systems is extremely well characterized. 
Um, and the, you know, one of the things I think that has surprised a lot of people in the field, including me, is the degree to which we have been able to get very quickly and sort of when viewed on the history of a new technology scale, um, these systems to be generally considered safe and robust. This is from Ethan Mogg's blog, One Useful Thing. The post is called Centaurs and Cyborgs on the Jagged Frontier. The interesting thing, one of the many interesting things that they covered on this one is that AI really helps the less capable employees more than the top employees. So if you divide people into the top half skilled participants and the bottom half skilled participants, using AI like ChatGPT helps both of them, but not equally. The bottom half sees a much stronger effect, a much stronger improvement in their ability to do the task. This is what they're going to refer to in this next section. Since November of last year, I've kept this list of like questions where very smart people in AI disagree. And to me, one of the most interesting is whether it will make income inequality worse or whether it make income mm -hmm. inequality better. And I feel like I've listened to lots and lots of your podcasts and it's come up a couple of times. And you talk in some ways about actually potentially making income inequality worse and the need for universal basic income to counter that. But this morning on this stage, Azim Azar was here and he was citing economic studies and other people have cited them as well that suggest that actually AI tools when implemented in say a call center, help the lowest paid workers more than the highest paid workers. As AI has been rolled out, has this changed your view of what will happen with income inequality in the world, both within countries and across countries? Let, let me give an example first. Uh, to, today we launched OpenAI for nonprofits, um, which is a new initiative to make our tools more uh, to cheaper and more widely available for nonprofits. Uh, so there's like discounts, there's ways to share best practices. Um, and pe people have been doing amazing work with this. Uh, one example is the International Rescue Committee using our tools uh, and having like great, great results from, from that integration, supporting um, like overstretched teachers and learners in, in real crisis zones. And I think that is an example of where these tools, because you can automate something that has been difficult uh, and make intelligence, however you want to call that, much more widely available, um, can really help people that need it uh, more than it would help people in like already a rich context. Um, so we're very excited to launch that program in general. And it get, it's a, an example of what you're talking about, uh, that you can see ways in which, lots of ways, doesn't take much imagination, that AI does more to help the poorest people than uh, the richest people. And we really believe that. We're enthusiastic about it. It is a huge part of why we want um, to build these tools. And I think it's a huge part of like the, the history of technology and yeah. the arc of what's been happening. So that will happen for sure. Uh, I think technology does a great deal to lift the world to more abundance, to greater heights, to better prosperity, whatever whatever you want to call it. Um, and I'm optimistic for that. I don't think that'll require any special intervention. Uh, I still expect, although I don't know what, and this is over a long period of time, this is not a like next year or, you know, the year after that kind of thing, but over a long period of time, I still expect that there will be some change required to the social contract, given how powerful we expect this technology to be. Um, I'm not a believer that there won't be any jobs. I think we always find new things to do, but I do think like the whole structure of society itself will, you know, be up for some degree of debate and reconfiguration. And that reconfiguration will be led by the large language model companies? No, no, no. Just the way the whole economy works uh, and what we, like what society decides, uh, we want to do and this has been happening for a long time as the world gets gets richer um social safety nets are a great example of this i expect we will decide we want to do more there and next this idea of what happens to the internet as more and more ai generated content is posted out there is, is flooding the web i'm actually kind of curious about this one myself here's how sam sees it unfolding all right let me ask you about another big thing that i worry about so one of the things that I'm most concerned about as we head to the next iteration of AI is that the web becomes almost incomprehensible, 
where there's so much content being put up because it's so easy to create web pages, it's so easy to create stories, it's so easy to do everything, that the web almost becomes impossible to navigate and get through. Do you worry about this? And if you think it's a real possibility, what can be done to make it less likely? I, I think the way we use the internet is likely to somewhat change, although that's gonna take a long time. Um, but I don't worry about it becoming incomprehensible. Um, I, I, I think you already see a little bit with like the way someone uses ChatGPT, where you can sometimes get information more effectively than going around to like, you know, search for something and click around. And this idea that the internet can sort of be brought to you, um, I think is a cool thing about where AI is going. Um, and so I think there could be changes to how we all use the internet like that, but I don't worry about it becoming like incomprehensible covered with like spam generated articles or anything. I mean, in a way, listening to you say that, I see a world where the internet almost collapses, where it is just these 10 or 20 large language models that are your interface. Is that more of what you see? No, I think people, I think, I mean, I can imagine like somewhat, I, I can imagine versions where like the whole web gets made into components and you have this AI that is like putting together, this is a way in the future, you know, putting together like the perfect web page for you every time you need something and everything is like live rendered for you instantly. Um, but I can't imagine that everything just gets to like one website that feels like against all instincts I'd have. Okay. Next to talk about AI governance. How do we as the world, how do we contribute to making decisions about what to do with AI? How do we tackle certain issues with policies we implement? One of the projects Sam was involved in was WorldCoin that tried to tackle this. It had other elements that caught a lot of flack. It had some troubling elements and it looks like it's maybe not going so well, but the idea, the problem of AI governance remains. So Sam gets this close to telling us something interesting. Take a listen. But this is from an interview you gave to the New Yorker eight years ago and you were t when I worked there and you were talking about governance of open AI and you said, we're planning a way to allow wide swaths of the world to elect representatives to a new governance board of the company because if I weren't in on this, I'd be like, why do these effers get to decide what happens to me? So tell me about that quote and your thoughts on it now. Um, something like that is still uh, what I believe would be good to do. Uh, we continue to talk about how to implement governance. Um, I probably shouldn't say too much more right now, but uh, I remain excited about something in that direction. Say a little bit more. I will pass, I'm sorry. <laughs> Next, they talk about the two former board members, specifically Helen Toner. As I've covered in another video, in a previous video, a lot of the things that Helen Toner says about what happened doesn't seem to line up with reality. Now, I don't know what happened, I wasn't there, but it, it seems like maybe she's not saying the truth. That's just my opinion, but what do you think Sam is saying here? So two of your former board members, Tasha McCauley, Helen Toner, just put out an op-ed in The Economist, and they said, after our disappointing experiences with OpenAI, these are the board members who voted to fire you before you came back and were reinstated as CEO, they said you can't trust um, self-governance at an AI company. And then earlier this week, Toner gave an interview with the TED AI podcast, which was quite tough. And uh, she said that the oversight had been entirely dysfunctional and in fact that she had learned and the board had learned about the release of ChatGPT from Twitter. Is that accurate? Look, I, I respectfully, but very significantly disagree with uh, her, her recollection of events, but I will say that I think Ms. Toner is, um, she genuinely cares about a good AGI outcome and I appreciate that about her. Um, I wish her well. I, yeah, I probably don't want to get into like a line by line refutation here. Um, when we released ChatGPT, uh, we, it was, you know, at the time called a low key research preview. We did not expect what happened to happen, but we had of course talked a lot with our board about a, a kind of 
research plan that we were a release plan that we were moving towards. We had at this point had you know 3.5, which ChatGPT was based on available for I think about eight months or something like that. We had long since finished training GPT-4, and we were figuring out uh, a sort of gradual release plan to that. Um, but yeah, like I, uh, I, I disagree with her her recollection of events. And finally, they talk about some bigger questions in the world of AI, in the world of humanity. And uh, I was kind of blown away by the depth of this discussion. Maybe some of you will roll your eyes at it, but I feel it is an interesting thing to think about. I want to ask you some um, kind of bigger questions about AI. Um, you know, I was just at an event with a lot of people talking about AI and humanism. And one of the participants made a really interesting argument. And he said, it's possible that the human creation of something that is more powerful than humans won't actually make us more egotistic, it'll make us more humble. We'll be like looking in a mirror and seeing ourselves naked. We will have a sense of awe at the machine and a sense of humility about our lives and that will teach us a new way of living. Do you think that's what's gonna happen? Does that ever happen to you? Do you ever look at the machine and then have a greater sense of humility about replacing the world? Um, personally, yes, I really do. And I think that's going to happen more broadly. I think that I, I, I would bet that there will be a widespread, you know, I'm not going to go this way for everybody. There'll be people who have egotistical freak outs about it, but I think in general, there will be a widespread, um, increase in awe for the world and the place in the universe and sort of the humbleness of human, the human perspective that I think will be very positive. Um, I, I was reflecting recently about how in, in some sense, the, the history of science has been humans have become less and less at the center. And you can look at all these examples where, you know, we used to believe that the sun rotated around the earth, uh, which was sort of a very, human-centered way to think about things. And then uh, we realized that, okay, actually it's the earth rotating around the sun. And actually there's, a, there's little white dots in uh, the sky or many stars and there's many galaxies beyond that. And then depending on how far you want to go with the analogy, you can say, all right, like there's the multiverse thing and this is really quite strange and we're really almost nothing. And um, the AI maybe be an, another example of where we get some additional perspective that sort of takes gives us more sort of like humbleness and awe for the much bigger thing that we're all part of. And I think that's been like an ongoing and really positive thing. With that said, my name is Wes Roth and thank you for watching.